I was going to talk today about opening lines and opening paragraphs. Um, I think they're about as important as anything in fiction, short fiction, long fiction, maybe even more important than endings, although you, know, you could argue back and forth about that. Uh, I have a bunch of different openings here. I haven't said who they are, but uh, we can go back and forth. Some of you will know all of them. and um, I think there's one nobody will know, but anyway. So I'm going to read them and talk about them and why I think they're good or problematic or um, why they're interesting to me. Um, and at any point, except when I'm reading a little passage, feel free to jump in, ask questions, uh, say you hate it, say you love it. Um, any of that. So I'll start. Struthers' first question when he reached the hotel was about his friend, yet on his learning that Waymarsh was apparently not to arrive till evening, he was not wholly disconcerted. A, telegraph, a telegram from him bespeaking a room only if not noisy, reply paid was produced for the inquirer at the office so that the understanding they should meet at Chester rather than at Liverpool remained to that extent sound. The same principle, however, that had prompted Strether not absolutely to desire Waymarsh's presence at the dock, that had led him thus to postpone for a few hours his enjoyment of it, now operated to make him feel he could still wait without disappointment. They would dine together at the worst, and with all respect to dear old Waymarsh, if not even for that matter to himself. There was little fear that in the sequel they shouldn't see enough of each other. Who is this? Right. Do you know which, which book? The Ambassadors. Yeah, it's the opening of The Ambassadors. Late Henry James. One of the reasons I started with this is that because when I was about 17 or 18, I was trying to read everything in the world. And I heard Henry James is a great writer. So I got, went to the library, I had no idea what I was doing. And I took out the ambassadors. And I brought it home and I read this opening. And I didn't get past the first page. I literally, the only time in my life, I threw the book across the room into a chair. And I remember saying, who is this guy? What's the point? get there. Why are you doing this? This is so frustrating. Can't you just say what you mean and get on with it? There's all this circling and circling. It's like he takes a scalpel and he's slicing consciousness. And notice too, E.B. White in The Elements of Style said, don't use double negatives. Say you're pleased. Don't say, you know, you ask someone for a date. How'd you like to have coffee? That wouldn't displease me. <laughs> and there's something about, um, how do you like me? You're not too dis something. And I bolded all the nots, the disses, the not, the not, without, dis, not, shouldn't. There's all this proscription. This is what you can't do. This is what, and set against that, there's two words here that really uh, stand out for me. One of them is desire. Desire. It's sort of the basic human desire. What do you want? What does your heart say? And the other, uh, what's the other word? Well, I'll, I'll find the other word to come back to it. But this is a guy who's constantly, the first few words, he's got a question. He's asking stuff. And then he can't settle down. It's like everything he wants to you know, the pleasure of Waymarsh's, you know, pleasure and desire. He, he sort of wants to see him, but he doesn't either. And he keeps qualifying everything, and he backs up, and he circles, and he comes back. This guy is maddening. His name is Lambert Strether, which is one of those great Henry James names. And he's gone to Paris. Well, he's gone to England first, but he's on his way to Paris. And he's the ambassador for a woman named Mrs. Newsom, who's a major character in the book, but she never appears in the book. 
You only hear. She's the one who pushes everything. And Strether is her agent, and he's gone to Europe to bring back the wayward son, Chad Newsom. So you're going off to Paris. Bring our boy back. He's been in Paris too long. How are you going to keep him down? And he comes from Woollett, Massachusetts, which is Worcester, Massachusetts. And the major industry there, which the Newsom family owns, is clocks. They make clocks. It's a clock factory. So the metaphor of clocks, time, be there, exact. Don't have fun. Don't follow your desire. You can't do that. You have to not wholly disconcerted, not noisy, not absolutely, without disappointment, and then shouldn't, shouldn't, the big shouldn't. Shake your four fingers. You can't do it. So this is a guy who's probably 40 or 50 years old, and he's probably never gotten laid, forgive the phrase. It's tough. It's really... And Henry James, who's writing late in his career, he's always talked his whole life about the obscure hurt. That's why he couldn't fall in love. That's why he couldn't engage. That's why, and Henry James, very late in his life, might have had an affair of sorts with a young Swedish, Swedish sculptor, a guy. No one is sure about that, but that's the suggestion. So, what is, is this a good opening or a bad opening? Would you keep reading? No? How come? Hmm? Not on a bet. Not on a bet. Uh huh. I I think this is our dilemma here. Unpublished. I wouldn't if I didn't know this guy, but now I know he's Henry James, and I haven't actually had the pleasure. I know there's something good in there. At least a lot of people think so. <laughs> right. They and all. Then, and then I begin to appreciate. It right. I, right. Because I think I'm already sold. Right. So I figure it's me, not him. Right. Right. What do the rest of you think? Would you, yeah? I love him, James. Yeah. I've read Portrait of a Lady, which I, in my head, I never ever put away. Right. So I've never read The Ambassador, and this is one of his um, most popular books. Right. But I, I mean, popular meaning it's supposed to be a great book. Yeah, he considered it his best work. I think that, I think that we're so used to story, um, and that we obsess about story, and story grabs us. Mm hmm Right. He very slowly brings about a narrative and he's brilliant at building character. Mm -hmm. Right. And slicing consciousness and circling back. And I think I know, but I'm not sure. And I'll come back and I'll go over it and we'll work it. I think the, the question you end up asking, and you know, I think any literary agent will tell you that your first page of your novel has to sell your novel. Right. But I think that's horrible advice. Right. Uh, for the sake of art, because yeah. it shouldn't be your first page shouldn't be an advertisement for the rest. Right. You know, it ought to be the, the laying out of your obsessive way of thinking. Right. So I, right. You know, when I read an opening paragraph of Henry James, and even the early, more easy to read Henry James, right. you sense him gearing up to do his grand cognitive oh, yeah. experiment that yep. he's going to do for the yep. next 800 pages. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't imagine if he was unknown that any agent in New York City or elsewhere would go for this. It's just too, yes. I mean, a lot of it's subjective because I remember back to the classics <laughs> we had in the high school mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. I thought it was crap 40 years ago, and I still think it's crap. Uh-huh. Uh, if, if you got a story to tell, I still think from the beginning... It, it doesn't need to be flashy, but it should do something to grab you. And right. Like this. And, and this doesn't grab you. you. This doesn't do it for you. Hmm. Brian? Or Brian, you had a... Uh, Right, and Edith Wharton was subsidizing his right. career. But, but, but 
but now as a classic and in the, in the writer's life, one of the great things about being well known is that you don't have to start with the flashy beginning. You right. can you can ask or trust that at least a fair number of readers will will give you patience for a while. Right. Yeah. Uh, now of course, obviously, uh, eventually they will lose that patience if you know but but that you can play with how you open books, you can play with pacing, you can play right. with emphasis and know that you read you know, could Ishiguro have ever published the unconsoled unless he had written Remains of the Day and famous when he right. the day. Yeah. Um, and so it's partly interesting how the style varies as writers get well known, not only right. that they just become inner inwardly more ambitious, but they recognize they can ask more right. of the reader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I started with this because I used to hate this. I didn't just hate it, I, I loathed it. I wanted to kill it. If I had a gun, I would have shot the text. <laughs> and I really, it took me several years to go back to James. And if you read James, you've got to start early, the earlier stuff, which is a little more straightforward. But this is a, like Dave Sala said, not on a bet, no way. This is a guy who's an engineer. You go from A to B, everything else is ornamentation. He's just, get there, what are the vectors? Boom, boom. And I used to really despise this, and I now think it's one of the greatest openings in literature. It's problematic as hell. I wouldn't dare try this. It's just, it's got all kinds of problems, and probably nine readers out of ten are going to just walk away at this point and say, I can't deal. But Is the other word fear? Yeah, it was fear and desire. Fear and desire. Great, thank you. Yeah, and those are like the huge between you want something, you want love, you want connection, you want anything, money, power, whatever, sex, but you fear, you fear, you can't get it. And so there's a whole lot in this, this opening, and this isn't even the whole first paragraph, it goes on for a while. Yeah. The, the accessibility, if you will, of um, this type of literature has to be taken into uh, account of the time it was right. written. Yep. They didn't have telecommunications. They didn't have the distraction right. of TV and radio. Right. This was the word. Right. And, uh, and with the exception of possibly scripture, right. this was the word. Yep. This is their TV. Mm -hmm. They interpreted words in a much more powerful way than yep. we do now. Absolutely. So the attention span yep. that a 21st century reader brings to it a text like this is very, very limited unless yep. you have the education and the background in interpreting Right, this. yeah. And unless you have the desire. And, you know, Henry James didn't have Twitter. It's just... All right, just in, in uh, parenthetically, pretty soon I will have to throw this away, so I better try to be calm like Henry James. Did you ever read Henry James? He was a great writer who came to Venice and looked out the window and smoked his cigar and thought. This is a guy in Europe who's really shaky, really shaky. It's, he's barely holding it together. And he writes this in a letter to a friend. Anyone know who this is? It may surprise you. It's Hemingway, of all people. And it's a Hemingway, you know, it's Hemingway's sentences. There's your straightforwardness. There's your, but, you know, even Hemingway, Mr. Muscles, but Hemingway was a very fragile, delicate creature. And, you know, it's like Henry James is, is sort of the pole star, the load star. All right, next one. Jackie Brown, at 26, with no expression on his face, said that he could get some guns. I can get your pieces probably by tomorrow night. I can get you probably six pieces. Tomorrow night, in a week or so, maybe 10 days, another dozen. I got a guy coming in with at least 10 of them, but I already talked to another guy about them, and he's, you know, expecting them. He's got something to do. So six tomorrow night, another dozen in a week. Anyone know this? It's, it's uh, Friends of Eddie Coyle, George V. Higgins, his first book. And one of the things I've always remembered this, this is the first... George B. Higgins I ever read, but look how fast it is. This is not Henry James. Um, this is another Bostonian, 
Uh, but it's Jackie Brown at 26 with no expression on his face. Jackie Brown is selling illegal weapons to another guy for a job, or maybe a job. But he's got no expression on his face. He's blank. He just, he's, a, he's a professional, professional criminal. Said that he could get some guns. It's like immediately, guns, danger, frisson. It's, it's tingling a little bit. It's like, and then the way he talks, and get your pieces probably by tomorrow night, and get you probably six pieces tomorrow night in a week or so, maybe. And I really love this. I got a guy coming in with at least, at least 10 of them, but I already talked to another guy about them, and he's, you know, expecting them. He's a, this, these are tough guys. This is low life. These are guys who hang out and own bad bars and bad neighborhoods. And Higgins worked as a, um, for the uh, federal prosecuting office in Boston for a lot of years. He knew these people. He spent a lot of time chasing them and prosecuting them. And I like how we're immediately put in this underworld world, these shady people who you don't want to lend money to, you don't want to have much to do with it because you're probably going to get hurt. And instead of saying, you know, Jackie Brown, who had tattoos, who was twitching, who had a greasy vest on, who, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't need to. Nor does he drop G's. I got you this, I'm going, going there and going. He doesn't do any of the only little mistakes in grammar, but I already talked to another guy about them and he's, you know, expecting them. This guy has a lot of people used to say, Higgins has been dead a few, probably a decade or so. The guy's got an extraordinarily good ear. I mean, an amazing ear. He, his, some of his books are almost, it's like uh, William Gaddis. You know, uh, it's almost all dialogue. And his ear is just crackling. It's extraordinarily good. And it's exciting and it's fast. All right, next one. Uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, George V. Higgins. This. Oh, the Hemingway was from a letter. It's from the collected letters of Hemingway. But I can't even remember where I found it exactly. Maybe in a biography or something. But. This was the year he rode the subway to the ends of the city, 200 miles of track. He liked to stand at the front of the first car, hands flat against the glass. The train smashed through the dark. People stood on local platforms, staring nowhere. A look they'd been practicing for years. He kind of wondered, speeding past, who they really were. Anyone know? Libra. Libra, Don DeLillo. It's the opening. And the main character is Lee Harvey Oswald. This is the young Lee Oswald in New York City. And I've always absolutely, I find DeLillo electrifying. There's like three living writers who I just, Alice Monroe, Don DeLillo, and William Trevor. But DeLillo, this is Lee Harvey Oswald. We don't know that yet. But there's some guy in the city. He's riding the subway to the end of the line. And there's a lot of lines here. There's 600 miles of them. Standing at the front of the first car, hands flat against the glass, smashing darkness. And you think of being in a subway, a train in the city. And this is in New York City. And it's like, think of the, you know, the going into the darkness, going with your hands on the glass. And then what he notices, what DeLillo notices, Lee Harvey Oswald noticing, is the people standing on the platform staring nowhere, a look they've been practicing for years. And it suggests that's Lee Harvey Oswald's assumption, that they've been practicing this. And maybe Lee is practicing a look, and he's been doing it for years. He kind of wondered, speeding past, who they really were. Who is he? Who is he? And what is? And he's like 17, 18. His single mom has taken him to New York City. He's a freaky kid from down south. He's about to bolt to the Soviet Union to become a communist. Uh, he's in the Marine Corps where he's an expert marksman. And it's like all this stuff. And it's like you're at the front of the thing, speeding through the darkness with your hands on the glass. And, and, you know, you're smashing darkness. I had a friend who spent a year 
in Germany, in Berlin. And when he came back, I said, how was it? And he said, it was good, but every single newspaper I picked up that mentioned an American or America had a line in it that said, the dark underbelly of the American dream. <laughs> and it's like, our William Carlos Williams, the pure products of America gone crazy. And it's <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald. And you think of the tunneling. This is underneath. The train's underneath in the darkness. It's sort of under everything. There's Lee waiting to explode on our consciousness. Um, what's the time? Oh, I started at 9. Okay. A throng of bearded men in sad-colored garments and gray, steeple-crowned hats intermixed with women, some wearing hoods and others bareheaded, was assembled in front of a wooden edifice the door of which was heavily tempered with oak and studded with iron spikes. Who's that, Austin? Scarlet Letter. Scarlet Letter. Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah. Opening line. This isn't uh, Club Med. This is a very, very different world. And the throng of bearded men, that lovely phrase, sad colored garments, he doesn't have to say gray or black or deep blue or brown. It's like sad colored garments. And what about those steeple crowned hats? Does that remind anyone of anything? Steeple crowned hats? Hmm? Witches, witches. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, and the women wearing hoods, others bear, assembled in front of a wooden edifice. And notice this the door of which was heavily timbered with oak, that's heavy, strong wood, and studded with iron spikes. Does that remind anyone of anything? Cross. Cross, crucifixion. Iron spikes and things. This is a dark world. This is eastern Massachusetts in like the you know, 1600s. And Nathaniel Hawthorne's, I think his great-grandfather, was a judge at the Salem witch trials. And he, so, he was so haunted by that that he dropped the E or added a, he dropped, I can't remember which, but he changed the spelling of his name because he wanted to distance himself from witch burners. He added the W? He added the W? Okay, thanks. So it's like, it's all here. Hester's about to be persecuted. All these righteous people, all this witchy world, this is really threatening. This is not a fun place. And Hawthorne puts it into place so quickly. Sad colored garments, steeple crowned hats. Any thoughts about the last couple? Well, with the Delillo, I, I like the way that Lee Harvey Oswald can't, can't really wonder who they are, the other people are, he's only kind of fine. Yeah. So in the, in the isolation. Um, I also just think, it's not necessarily related to what he's trying to do, but that the very first four words strike me as, as, as something like very Delilah-esque. This was the, the year. year. Yeah, 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 he almost declaimed, this was the year. And 1963 was the year when a lot of things changed in this country. I mean, all of you who are over 50, we, we all know where, just as they knew where they were when De um, Pearl Harbor, I remember Kennedy getting shot vividly. And it's like... I called off basketball. You might? I called off basketball practice. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah. A salesman who shared liquor and steered while sleeping, a Cherokee filled with bourbon, a VW no more than a bubble of hashish fumes captained by a college student, and a family from Marshalltown who head-on and killed forever a man driving west out of Bethany, Missouri. Jesus son? Yep. Who? Jesus' son, Dennis Johnson. For me, one of the two or three greatest collections of stories, linked stories, in the last... 20, 30 years. What does this evoke for you? Want to get in the car with these people? <laughs> <coughs> Any? It's fast. 
It's intense. It's also, I think, kind of funny in a sick way. Uh, Jesus' son is one of the most extraordinarily funny, horrifying. It's like, oh my God, and you just this crazy laughter. The main character in Jesus' son, who goes throughout the book, his name is Fuckhead. That's his only name, Fuckhead. And it's like he's, he's an alcoholic, he's a drug addict, he's nuts, he knows all these. He, he would know Jackie Brown. Except he's too fucked up and he's too much of a fuckhead to really be very effective at selling guns or anything. He's just a mess. He's a mess. And some of these details, a salesman who shared his liquor and steered while sleeping, without while sleeping, it's like immediately, it's like just kind of, oh my God, get me out of here. This is the, a Cherokee filled with bourbon. Nothing against, you know, the Native American rate of alcoholism is like 60%. You don't, and then a VW, no more than, you know, and a VW is a fragile car. It's like, it's, we're not talking about the new VW, this is the old Beetle. It's like a tin can with a motor and wheels. You get hit in that, you're, um, and I love this captained, captained. I'm the captain of this ship. Holy shit, you're the captain? A bubble of hashish fumes and a VW and a tin can? And we got the captain here. The captain will take you know, the captain will take you through hell. You can trust Walter Mitty, the captain will steer you through hell. And then boom, and a family from Marshalltown who head on and killed forever. A man driving west out of Bethany. And Bethany's got all this religious stuff. And weirdly enough, this is all about addict, addicts and messed up people. I mean, they're just a train wreck and a car wreck and a plane wreck. And yet this is a book that really is, it's about grace and redemption. It really is about religion almost, about people who are so broken and so messed up and they're moving towards some sort of, you know, the title comes from a Lou Reed song. It says, when I'm rushing on my run, I feel like Jesus' son. And it's almost like, you know, heroin addicts, I'll call it. They're almost seeking God. They're almost looking for the oceanic. They're almost, you know, in Brian's world, his scientist, he's looking for some sort of cosmic, stellar, oceanic feeling. And in a weird way, as you go through this book, and it's only like 150 pages, it's really extraordinary. And Johnson was a poet before he was a fiction writer. He was an inch, perhaps two, under six feet, powerfully built, and he advanced straight at you with a slight stoop of the shoulder, head forward, and a fix from under stare, which made you think of a charging bull. His voice was deep, loud, and his manner displayed, a kind of dogged self-assertion, which had nothing aggressive in it. Lord yeah. yeah. Lord Jim. Conrad, yeah, and it's just, I love the muscularity of this and the rhythm. He was an inch, perhaps two, under six feet, power, and he advanced straight at you with a fix from under. It's really powerful, and you, you want to get out of this guy's way, and then at the very end, he says, which had nothing aggressive in it. It's like, what? What is this? I mean, what did you just do to us and set up? And then you suddenly, and think of the title, Lord Jim. What about that? Shouldn't it be Lord James? Lord James. Lord Jim. It's, the title is an oxymoron. It's very informal, and it's very formal. It's got a title. And right in there, you got this contradiction. And so much of this, it's about a guy who in so many ways is really heroic. And yet he does something so cowardly and so abject that he's, he's, shun, he's, he's monstrous. He could be indicted. He should be indicted. And yet he's, and Marlowe, who narrates it and narrates a lot of Conrad's work, keeps saying, he's one of us. He's one of us. He's not different from you and me. It's sort of like the human, he's, he's both lordly and he's just this gym guy. He has all these things, all these contradictions. I'll pause after one more and get your feedback. Uh, Via Revere, she's just a kid in the morning, except that she's sitting still in her bed, 
In the thick of far gone winter, with her mouth parted open like a grown woman's in thought. Life's got her for the first time pinned up against the wall, open mouthed. But other than her mouth and her stillness, the rest of her, pure kid, but stunned. She slouched in static, puffy eyed, staring at the rug where it meets the wood floor. She's sitting, waiting, lopsided, dumbstruck, not even thinking yet what to think. Eight year old girl. What she, she just lose her doll? Broke a toy? This is something really bad has happened to this kid. She's pure kid. She's still a kid. Slump, stunned, mouth open, all those details that just boom, boom, boom. In the thick of far gone winter, with a mouth parted open, saying nothing, is there no voice there? It's just speechless, struck dumb, but like a grown woman's in thought, but she's still pure kid. Anyone know this one? I, I was pretty sure no one would know this. This is Eliza Minot, M-I-N-O-T. It's called The Tiny One. And it's a book I've taught two or three times. I love this book. I think it's an extraordinary book. And so hardly anyone, it's a book I've bought and given to people. And I think it's remarkable. It's, it's an autobiographical novel in the Minot family. It was this really prosperous family in Manchester by the sea on the North Shore of Boston. Her mother, when she was eight years old, went out on, into the town in a little station wagon and the car stalled on the railroad tracks and her mother was killed. And it was probably suicide, but they don't know. And that's what this novel is about. And it gets you in so quickly. Just the name itself, Via. How to get from one place to another. Revere. 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 And it's down. Any thoughts at this before I motor through? Any thoughts, opinions? Yeah. Just really a question. Um, I have a novelist friend who feels that the first page of the novel should contain the DNA for the rest of the novel. And I, I feel like for all of these, the way that, you, I mean, I, some of these I haven't read, obviously most of them, and um, all of them seem to be doing that. Yep. It's kind of setting you up right away. And yep. You've got the whole story actually in the first paragraph yep. for all of these. It's very yep. striking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it seems like in this uh, <coughs> world where any number of the first three should be the ones to get into the accident. Right. And the family gets killed. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It is random. Grace is random. Anything could happen. And it's usually unfair. Yeah. The other thing is that it's the family who drives into the van. And so there's a family on a collision course. Mm -hmm. So my kid just sense that he, like, no one's safe. Uh -huh. There's all these people who are crazy who are out there. Like, right. The family who does the, has the accident. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you got the salesman sleeping, steering asleep, the Cherokee with bourbon, the, the aluminum can with hashish fumes. And who does the damage here? The family from Marshall. And who the hell could figure it? John? If I'm not mistaken about this, the it's the family from Marshalltown that the narrator ends up getting a ride from, right? So yeah, in yeah. The yeah. thing that I always found interesting about this first paragraph is that the narrator presents this list mm -hmm. as though they're all of equal value to right. the story. Right, right. And he does not put himself in that car right. until later. Right, So yeah. it's only when you read the story again that you realize that he is, he is he's rejecting the agency he has in the scene. Right. right. And it's sort of like a signaling of the... Of, the narrator's detachment right what's happening yeah around, which is ends up being what the story is about. yeah yeah and he's he has a wet sleeping bag it's raining heavily staggering on the side of the highway after the, it's just nuts Liam? the other thing that's really cool is <laughs> the second uh, sentence of bourbon because of 
this positioning between the steers while sleeping and the bubbles that she's giving sort of makes you imagine a, uh, an SUV like just sort of filling up with alcohol. Yeah. Um, and I actually, the first, like when I read it, I didn't think of uh, a person who was, you know, who was drunk. I thought of like literally a car full of alcohol. <laughs> Floating down there. You got a bubble of hashish and you got a tub of booze. <laughs> I've never seen that. That's what that's what occurred to me. And he's able to sort of create that duality just just with the other details around it mm -hmm. associated. Yeah, yeah. It's incredibly packed. It's rich. And I think you're absolutely right about the DNA of the novels or a story or whatever, it's all here right away. You don't have to advertise it. You don't have to be dumb about it, but just particular and specific. I, I had read and loved uh, The Scarlet Letter when I was, I don't know, in my early 20s, painting houses in the summer, and I went home, and I read The Scarlet Letter eating a cheese and tomato sandwich. And I loved, I don't know why it hit me. You're, you, you shouldn't like Hawthorne before you're 30, at least. Or, but I just loved it. And I never even noticed this stuff, a lot of it. But it's subliminal. You know, heavy oak with spikes. It's, oh man, how did I miss it? It's about, it's about persecution, crucifixion. Martha? Oh, I'm sorry, aren't you, you had your hand up? Yeah. You're not Martha, though. <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah, her mother, mom killed herself. What was worse than that? I'm just curious what lives in your imagination. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's at that level of damage, that sort of catastrophic, what worse could happen to a kid. Besides the neutral expression that she wore when she was alone, Mrs. Freeman had two others, forward and reverse, that she used for all her human dealings. Her forward expression was steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck. Her eyes never swerved to left or right, but turned as the story turned, as if they followed a yellow line down the center of it. Any, who's this? Very good, good eye. Yeah, Flannery O'Connor. It's, I think it's good country people, short story. And the savage Flannery O'Connor who takes no prisoners, dying from, you know, the early 20s, she's got a terminal illness, and she knows it, and it kills her when she's 39. She's a very devout, complicated Catholic in Milledgeville, Georgia. She keeps pe peacocks as pets. She lives with her mother. Um, she, um, this one, <laughs> Freeman, Freeman, Freeman. Amen. She wore one to a board in reverse that she used for all her human dealings. This is this woman's bad news, and Flannery O'Connor loves to set these people up, and then she's going to crush them. <laughs> Tough stuff, and she does it really fast too. You know, driving. It's sort of like compare this to Lord Jim, the opening, but there's nothing aggressive in it. There's everything aggressive in her everything aggressive in her and she does it very fast and so right away you know the story's going to be about her getting hers she's going to be taught the lord is going to smite her big time <laughs> it was about 11 o'clock in the morning mid-october with the sun not shining and a look of hard wet rain in the clearness of the foot hills I was wearing my powder blue suit with dark blue shirt, tie and display handkerchief, black brogues, black wool socks with dark blue clocks on them. I was neat, clean, shaved and sober, and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything the well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. John. <laughs> Did you just look up a smile on my face? Yeah, yeah. Chandler, of course. Chandler. 
Raymond Chandler, the great Raymond Chandler. Yeah. Uh, liked, I, have, I love these guys. James M. Cain, Raymond Chandler, Hammett, Elroy. It's really fast and brisk. This was written probably around 1930s. Uh, it's so fresh. It's so, and it's funny too. I'm usually a slob. I'm usually really slobby. I'm dirty. I smell. I don't shave and I'm drunk. But today, like the Newsom family, I got clocks on my sock, baby. I'm here and I'm on time and I'm shaved. And, um, and he's really on to himself. It's really delightful stuff. I, I, just, I, I would go anywhere with this voice, and I do. I go back to Chandler a lot. But it's just, and, and 11 o'clock in the morning, mid-October, with the sun not shining, it's sort of like Jackie Brown with no expression on his face. There's this neutrality. We're in California. It's, you know, L.A. It ought to be. So it's not shining. That's all. It, and a look of hard, wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. You know, and it's like Connor. It's, it's sort of muscular and sinuous and rhythmic. It's just, it's really, I, it, if you've never read Raymond Chandler and even you think, ah, oh, that's all macho foolishness, but... He's really on to himself, and he's always making fun of himself, and it's just very funny. And he almost, with a couple of James M. Cain, Hammett, Chandler, they invented the, the, it's how we see L.A. still, whether you know it or not. It's L.A., it's neon, wet rain on pavement, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a deeply American idiom. And one of the reasons I ended with this was, Chandler is almost a quintessential American writer, yet he was born and raised in England. Henry James is a quintessential international writer, but he was born and raised in the States. Traveled a lot, but he's essentially started out. He went to overseas. He went to England. Chandler came here. And you can't get much different style than Chandler and Henry James. What would they make of each other? And it reminds me of a wonderful blurb or, uh, by Ross MacDonald, who's another great hard-boiled writer. He said, Raymond Chandler wrote like a slumming angel and invested the sun-blinded streets of Los Angeles with a romantic presence. And I thought, man, I wish someone would write that. I wish I could write a book worthy of that sort of, you know, a slumming angel. All right, one final thing. This is not prose. This is poetry. This is from Wallace Stevens. And all of this stuff, openings, why begin? Why even try to do this? Why are we all here in this awful, frustrating, humiliating, lonely experience of writing? Why do we do it? And it's a good question. I guess all of us must ask ourselves this. This is from a poem called A Postcard from the Volcano, and it begins, children picking through our bones will never know that these were once as quick as foxes. And he imagines we're all gone, but what's left? There's a volcano, it's engulfed everything. We're all gone. And this is one of the best, most compressed, most elegant, most beautiful responses to why do that? Why write? Why bother doing this ridiculous thing? No one cares anymore. They're on Twitter. Stephen says, we left what we felt at what we saw. What we said of it became a part of what it is. Notice that we left, we felt. It's not we leave, we feel, we see, we say, we become. Everything's in the past tense here, everything. This is back then, except for one thing. He violates, just as James violates the never use double negatives. Stay in tense, don't shift tense, don't shift tense. They're gonna beat you in the head with a grammar book. You can't shift tense. Except the last word here is present tense. So what you, le what you left at what you felt, uh, what was left at what we felt at what we saw, what we said of it, what we write about, how we experience life, and what we say about it back then, 
The only thing that remains, Yeats says, let something remain. What remains? It is. It becomes a part of what is. He goes from the past tense to the present tense. My creature lives. It is. So not only by leaving what you feel or what you saw and what you say of it, it changes the thing. It becomes something else. You writing about it, looking, experience, feeling, seeing, hearing. You take it in. And you leave, you write it down. You leave what you felt and what you, and what you say of it, what you write about, becomes a part. It's not just this idle, dead thing. It's the only thing living in the end. It remains, it endures. He answers Yeats's question. That's what endures, art, and your faith in doing it or trying to do it. That's all I got.